central question, I would argue, is how do we go about thinking about a policy framework in the United States to get there? And I think we're at a unique time in our history. We have uh, the President recently in the State of the Union spoke eloquently about the importance of clean energy. Uh, we have uh, uh, partisan differences clearly in that issue, but we also have two new energy chairs in the Senate uh, who are interested in working across the aisle together and coming up with new solutions. So I think we're at a pretty important and uh, interesting moment in our history as to whether we can move forward. And that's the focus of the next panel or debate is really to honestly and openly air some of the uh, that we have, if you will, inside this movement. There's obviously a, a big debate, if you will, between this movement and the movement that doesn't believe in the first three things I listed, that climate change is real, it's a problem, um, or that it's um, something uh, we need to be focusing on. But among the people who believe that, we certainly by no stretch of the imagination have unanimity. There are folks who think we should set a price or set a cap, there are other folks who think we should do more R&D, and et cetera, et cetera. So that's really the focus of this next, um, of this next discussion. Uh, before I introduce uh, our moderator, John Broder, I just want to point out uh, ITIF's clean energy team, Matt Stepp, uh, Megan Nicholson, and Clifton Yin. I don't know where Clifton is, but um, they do a fantastic job in research and analysis, and I encourage you to go online and read their work, and increasingly uh, Matt's work. Uh, Matt is now a blogger at Fortune, Forbes, one of the four, uh, and I encourage you to look at that. So um, if I could ask our folks to come on up. Uh, this panel is going to be led by John Broder, who you all know, or should know. He reports on energy and environment for the New York Times. He's here in the Washington Bureau. He's been a reporter since 1973 and has covered local, state, and national government, banking, defense, intel, White House, and numerous political campaigns. Previously, uh, he was LA bureau chief for the Times. He was also at the Los Angeles Times newspaper for over 12 years. He's uh, lectured at many, many universities, Yale, University of Michigan, et cetera, uh, and is really one of the leading um, uh, members of the fourth estate when it comes to writing eloquently about these uh, energy and environment issues that are so important. So, John? Thanks very much. I'm glad to be here and I'm hoping to learn some things myself. It's a common place for a person who's introducing a panel to say that the panelists need no introduction and in this case they don't because their bios are in the little booklet that uh, you got when you walked in. Uh, I think Fred Krupp, uh, the longtime president of the Environmental Defense Fund, will be speaking first. Um, the one thing that, that I will say, because this sets up the, the dialectic that I'm hoping we'll see today, is that EDF has been uh, one of the leading voices for the use of market um, forces to address problems of the common, like pollution. Uh, and EDF was instrumental in pushing the Waxman-Markey bill across the finish line in the House. Uh, the Senate, as you all know, proved to be a, t a tougher nut to crack. And perhaps um, Fred will talk a little bit about where market can be effective in, in addressing pollution, like in the 1990 Clean Air Act amendments and how it addressed the acid rain problem, and where so far in climate change it has not yet been that successful. Ted Nordhaus is the chairman of the Breakthrough Institute, longtime affiliated with Yale University, uh, and he's a, a fellow that keeps me honest as a reporter because I often refer to sort of the classic economic approach to a pollution problem saying that it's usually either addressed by market forces, as EDF will explain, uh, or by regulation. And uh, every morning that I publish such nonsense, I get an email from the Breakthrough Institute saying you left out innovation. Uh, and that uh, scientific innovation and the, the minds of entrepreneurs sometimes turns out to be the best way of addressing these problems. Uh, with that, I'm going to let our panelists take it over, and I hope you will be passing forward questions at a rapid clip to make my job easier. Thanks very much. Thank you, John, and um, good afternoon. 
I agree with what uh, Rob said just a few minutes ago, that this is a very interesting moment in the history of this issue, a very interesting moment, particularly in our country, because we have a confluence of um, technology coming together, uh, investment coming together, and perhaps most important, the reemergence of political will, at least uh, political will in one important place, the White House. The, um, over the years, uh, I've read with great interest uh, many of the things that Ted has written, not all, sorry Ted, but many, and I know um, Ted has been a great advocate for the importance of making clean energy cheaper, and that is important and it is very appealing. Um, sometimes Ted has suggested that the focus needs to be there and it's misplaced to try to make dirty energy more expensive. I actually think we need to do both. We need to make clean energy cheaper, absolutely. But we can't afford to rely, put all of our eggs in that basket, uh, because we don't know uh, for sure that clean energy can ever be cheaper than dirty, uncontrolled uh, burning of coal and other fossil fuels. So I fully endorse the idea that we need to invest in research and development and also uh, have policies that spur private investment in research and development in addition to government money. At the same time, I think we need to make sure that when folks uh, burn fossil fuels and throw pollution into our atmosphere and our lungs, um, that the full social costs of doing that um, using the atmosphere as a garbage can or our lungs as a receptacle are included, uh, internalized by the businesses. Now, admit admittedly, that's been very difficult to do at the federal level. Uh, very difficult. To me, though, um, just because it's hard doesn't mean it's unnecessary. I continue to think uh, that it's going to be very important for us to do that uh, in the United States and around the world. Now the Environmental Defense Fund is made up mostly of scientists, <coughs> economists, and uh, people that are expert about politics. Uh, the scientists uh, tell us about the problem, the economists tell us what needs to be done to fix it, and those that are expert in politics um, advise on how it can be possible to thread the needle in our political system and get things done. <clears throat> now the scientists right now are, are pretty blunt. What they are saying is that we're making progress but not nearly quick enough. That we need to reduce emissions of carbon pollution and methane and other short-lived forcing gases a whole lot uh, pretty quickly, or we're screwed. The economists uh, start, that, that's by the way not a scientific term, but um, the, uh, the economists start out equally blunt. They tell us that we absolutely need a market signal to internalize the externalities, to drive down the use of high carbon energy sources. Things get a little less clear after that, what kind of sig signal is needed. Uh, but at least they agree uh, on the first proposition. Uh, the political experts at EDF are perhaps the most blunt. They say that no matter what's needed, uh, this Congress is not uh, going to deliver a cap or a tax on carbon. So um, they also tell us that when we do get to a point where it's possible for Congress to deliver a market signal, that the politics are going to have uh, a dominant hand in shaping what sort of solution, whether it's a cap, whether it's a tax, whether it's some hybrid solution um, of the two. Now everyone um, that I know of in this area has favored policy ideas. EDF has long favored a cap because it gives us certainty about um, environmental emissions, about carbon emissions. And the studies that have been done show that um, it's working very well in Europe. It's working well to bring emissions down, 
Uh, this week, the price is very low, so those who think that the objective is a high carbon price um, will point that out. I actually think the objective is low carbon emissions, don't you? And from that standpoint, um, it's, it's working very well, although certainly um, uh, could, use, um, to be ref could use some refinements. In California, we've just put in place a AB32 cap and trade system in California. Um, I realize that despite these two experiments, there are those like uh, Greg Mankiw and Kevin Hassett who argue for a carbon tax. There's a whole camp that argue for cap and dividend. Um, there are lots of possibilities out there. Australia has a carbon tax that morphs over time into a cap. But um, while I welcome this debate, to me, the only criteria that's important is what gets emissions down fast. The idea is not that any single policy is a silver bullet. The idea is that we need to get emissions down fast, and that should be the test of any policy that's put out there. Um, in the meantime, what happens since Congress is not likely to give us any of the above, this Congress, in the near future? Well, it turns out that the meantime is pretty damn important because as Rob um, started us out here this afternoon saying this is, a, this is a pivotal moment and some big decisions are being made. Power companies are deciding whether they should cut, shut down coal-fired power plants or retrofit them to meet the new EPA regulations. And it's likely that whatever investment they make is going to be uh, a very important um, factor in shaping what exists in the long haul. It's sunk capital, and regulators will be very reluctant to uh, strand those costs to shut those things down once new investments are made. So this is a critical moment, it's likely that what's built in the next five years uh, or what's retrofit in the next few years uh, will be around for the rest of at least my lifetime. And so I think there are three uh, very important objectives uh, right now. First, the President needs to go forward and finalize health standards for power plants. That's an immediate thing that he needs to do um, and that in its, of itself will help drive uh, cleaner choices. Second, we do need to proceed with research and development and employment. Both policies that um, fund uh, research, we've seen that R&D can make a big difference in the clean energy space, particularly when it occurs at the same time that government is regulating to require um, cleaner air. Um, and uh, I'm happy to say that the Alliance to Save Energy is also has a series of suggestions coming from their Commission on Energy Efficiency that I served on that will be out next February, uh, that will be out this February 7th next week. So not that long to wait. Um, I think it is possible to double America's productivity um, for the same unit of energy and um, I think there'll be a series of ideas to do exactly that. All of those things, to investing in research and development and R&D, investing in policies that deploy energy efficiencies and renewables help. They help reduce the political resistance to actually um, getting the real tough climate legislation we need to put a price on carbon or a cap into place. As part of that, um, we also need a whole series of new policies in our public utility commissions, our FERCs, our regional transmission organizations. You know, I'm reminded that when I was growing up, a phone looked like a pink princess phone or a beige wall set or a black phone. Now we've had an IT revolution. We had an IT revolution because of government policies, and government policies in the energy sector can achieve the same level of innovation. Right now there are just too many obstacles in the way of innovation in the energy sector, obstacles that keep the system looking pretty much like what Thomas Edison designed. 
we can um, put in place policies that speed uh, a modern grid, a smart grid, energy efficiency, smarter appliances, cars, airplanes, um, and everything else that burns an, uh, fuel and emits carbon pollution. My last point, uh, my third point, is the natural gas revolution that is underway. Uh, we need to work very hard to make sure that that is done in a clean way and that is done in a way that harvests the maximum climate benefits. A year ago in the pr proceedings for the National Academy of Sciences, uh, um, a paper was published that was very important that shows that if the emissions of methane are above 3% system-wide in, in natural gas, that um, actually, if that were to be the case, that converting coal to natural gas would be worse for the climate over the immediate next 20 years, which is a pretty important time frame if you're worried about positive feedbacks, the melting of the tundra, the disappearance of coral reefs. Um, and so uh, the fact of the matter is we don't know what the leak rate is in the United States. Uh, EDF is cooperating with a lot of companies and, and participating in a series of studies now to nail this, but I already know enough to tell you that uh, we need to work to reduce emissions and it's very possible to do that. 67% of the emissions come from uh, just 10% 10 10 of the wells. So we should continue to debate solutions, um, but as we're debating them in theory, we should do the things we need to do now to maximize the gains we can make over the next couple of years. Thanks. All right. Well, John, I'm going to correct you again. Um, <laughs> okay. uh, thanks for the great introduction. Um, I am actually not the Nordhaus affiliate. Oh, I'm Yeah, that's I'm my sorry. uncle, oh, uh, Bill, who um, uh, probably actually agrees with Fred more than I do. Um, <laughs> but, um, and, and Fred, thanks for, um, I, th I think, actually sort of giving a pretty succinct um, sort of view of, I think, what has been the sort of the conventional view on how to deal with this problem. And I'm, I'm going to offer, I think, a fairly different perspective on this. Um, so I want to do a couple of things. I want to suggest sort of three things that I think point to where we're going. Um, and then I think I want to talk about three other things that we really need to get focused on doing. So in terms of where we're heading, I think if there is uh, one thing that is really uh, now clear, it's that, uh, or should be, <laughs> it's that we are not going to price, cap, or regulate our way to a low carbon future. Um, the reasons for that are part political and part technological. Uh, technologically, uh, present low carbon technologies uh, simply can't scale uh, at the uh, scale that we need them to if we're actually going to have much impact on climate change. Um, and that's because, as I think we've discussed um, at some length earlier in the day, they're too costly, they're intermittent, and there are, uh, as uh, Fred rightly points out, um, uh, a number of other, uh, a, a wide range of other non-market barriers to their deployment. Um, politically, I think what's become clear is that no political economy in the world has been willing to raise the cost of energy sufficiently to deploy significant amounts of zero carbon energy. Um, and that is because cheap energy is too important to living standards in the developing world and too important to economic competitiveness pretty much everywhere. So that's my first point. Second, uh, the key to making progress uh, both politically and substantively, uh, meaning actually putting policies in place that actually have an impact on emissions, um, is uh, developing energy technologies that are clean, cheap, and abundant. Um, and um, I think if you look at what has happened with the gas revolution in this country over the last five years, you get a, a pretty powerful example of how quickly we can make progress on emissions when we have a technology that is better, cheaper, and cleaner than the incumbent 
fossil technology, which in the case of the United States has been coal. Um, and when we say make clean energy cheap, we don't mean just subsidize it so it costs less or make dirty energy cost more. We actually know how to make these technologies cheaper through public investments, a range of public investments. Um, uh, but that takes time and it takes money. Um, the third point is that I think that the path that the Obama administration um, appears likely to take in the second per term has been perceived as a kind of plan B, what you do when you can't get a cap or a price on carbon. Um, but it's actually what we should have been doing uh, all along and point actually is reflective of the way that we've actually always successfully dealt with these kind of problems. Um, and if you want to sort of summarize that, what I think that is going to be is modest pollution regulations, mostly around pollutants that people actually experience and don't like, conventional air pollutants, um, continuing investments in innovation and deployment of low carbon technologies. Um, that is what has driven the drop in U.S. emissions over the last several years. Um, and uh, I think it presents a, um, uh, a pretty marked contrast to what's happened in Europe, where they've had a cap and trade program in place for almost a decade now. Europe's emissions are down, but it's not clear that their cap and trade program has had much to do with any of it. In fact, there's a new UBS analysis that I think came out just this week that concluded that there's uh, the ETS, unless it's completely revised, is unlikely to have any impact on European emissions until at least 2045. Um, so I think that's sort of the picture, that's where we stand today. I think those are the lessons that we should be learning from really what is now 20 years of effort to deal with this issue. Uh, what do we want to do now? Well, I want to, um, you know, actually, uh, I, I think there's a bunch of things that I would agree with Fred on. Uh, I would really commend the EDF uh, for their um, really actually kind of leading the environmental movement towards actually dealing with gas as opposed to trying to wish it away. Um, and in fact, uh, I would argue that um, we need to actually double down on the gas revolution. Uh, and Fred's right, that means we need to clean it up, both so that we can deal with some of the methane and other pollution problems, the acceptance of the technology, not only here, but around the world. Um, you know, we need to continue to expand gas production and gas demand. Um, um, and we need to continue to raise the bar for coal so that we don't backslide if gas prices, as they almost certainly will, uh, rise again, uh, already are. Um, second, we need to continue to support clean energy innovation. Uh, as a number of people earlier in the day have pointed out, that is not just R&D. Um, that's important, but we actually need to support innovation at every stage from basic research all the way through to early stage commercialization. Um, and we need to have both patience and a high tolerance for failure. Um, you know, DOE uh, in this town especially has sort of been a very convenient whipping boy, uh, but the reality is there's no gas revolution in this country uh, without 30 years of DOE investment uh, and support for that technology. Um, and those programs were vilified throughout the 80s and 90s by both the environmental movement and the anti-tax movement as massive government boondoggles. Um, uh, Yale University now concludes that um, shale gas revolution over the last five years has added $100 billion annually to the U.S. economy. It's a very conservative estimate, the economic benefits, um, at a cost of somewhere between 10 and 20 billion over about uh, 20 years uh, in federal investment. In fact, um, if you count out all of fed, all federal investments in all energy technologies um, since 1950, um, the annual benefit of the shale gas revolution uh, is about one eighth of that total investment every year. So eight years, you pay for the $800 billion in all subsidies, R&D, deployment, tax benefits, everything for fossil, renewables, nuclear, all of it, eight years. So when we talk about the payback on sustained public investments in technology, that's the kind of payback uh, we see. And every technology isn't going to do that. There's going to be failures, um, but you don't need a lot of successes like shale gas to more than pay for it all. 
Um, finally, um, even as we continue to support energy innovation, we've got to reform our energy innovation programs and institutions so we get more bang for the buck. Um, I think that means a couple of things. It means less money for basic research and big science and more for applied research. It means closer coordination and collaboration with private firms uh, that are attempting to develop real technologies uh, to bring to market. Um, and it needs that we need to subsidize innovation uh, and not just output. Our subsidies for energy technologies need to function less like agricultural crop subsidies, which is basically the way they work now, and more like defense procurement, where government plays the role of a demanding consumer paying for better performance at lower cost um, to drive the cost down and the performance up of these technologies. Um, and as we're doing that, we need to phase down support for mature technologies. Uh, we're already seeing that, for instance, with the PTC. We've also seen it with ethanol. But at the same time, we need to continue to support deployment of earlier stage technologies uh, that have greater potential to see big leaps in performance and declines in costs. So for instance, we may phase out support for onshore wind turbines. Uh, we might want to continue to support offshore wind, we might want to continue to support wind in uh, low, uh, d designed for lower uh, uh, wind sites, um, places where it's hard to economically build wind turbines now. And I think the same goes across a range of other technologies. So we need to actually be uh, much more uh, granular in looking at how we support technologies, at what stage they are, and how we drive, uh, uh, continue to improve the performance and drive the cost down. So uh, on that note, I'll wrap things up. Hopefully we can have some good discussion and debate and also have time for lots of questions from the audience. Can you hear me? Yeah, good. Both Ted and Fred talked about the shale gas revolution. I'd like to continue that discussion a little bit more. Um, uh, natural gas is a fossil fuel, and some refer to it as a bridge fuel to some unspecified future. Uh, but aren't we just substituting one fossil fuel for another? Gas, which is somewhat cleaner than coal, again, if the, if the fugitive emissions are controlled and other losses in pipelines and drilling, uh, that could leave, leave us, you know, 50 years from now still dependent on sucking resources out of the ground, uh, and will it get us to 80% reduction by 2050, will it keep us below two degrees? Uh, what does the science tell us about this? Is this a bridge to more fossil fuels? Fred? Uh, I would say, John. Am I on here? Yeah. I, I would say that um, I don't think the Environmental Defense Fund nor anyone in the environmental community who cares about this issue should be promoting the use of natural gas. I think we should be recognizing reality and not, as Ted said, assuming we can wish it away. And what that means is we have to clean up natural gas so that neighbors are not victimized. There ha haven't been a lot of examples of water contamination through fractures, but there have been thousands of cases of water contaminating through surface spills or the drill casing not being well lined. There are uh, people getting sick. I was in Washington County uh, last year um, and met a woman who had been forced to move, abandon her family farm. Uh, her son was living with neighbors so he could attend school because of the noxious fumes coming out of the wells. So we have to clean this up both for the neighbors and for the atmosphere. If we do that, then we maximize the benefits that we get in the real world where people are switching out of coal and into natural gas. But I don't think we should be promoting it. On the contrary, I think we should be doing whatever we can to lock, to avoid excessive lock-in in a new natural gas plants. Right now, a lot of the new natural gas electrons are coming from existing capacity. And we should be locking in energy efficiency gains and renewables instead. Ted? Well, I'm, uh, I'll go uh, a lot further than Fred. I think we should be promoting natural gas um, uh, for a bunch of different reasons. Uh, one is, uh, it is it is the killer app for coal in this country um, and um, uh, has the potential to do that a lot of other places. Um, uh, and, and there is literally 
really nothing else anywhere in the world that has done that. So, you know, full stop. Um, and we should remember that gas has made some real headway uh, in comparison to coal here, but coal is still king <laughs> pretty much everywhere else in the world. Um, there are problems uh, beyond the fact that, you know, it's half the carbon, which means it's still a lot of carbon. Right. There are problems with gas. But the problems, and I think Fred alluded to this, and I, uh, these are problems we know how to solve. Um, uh, you know, it's basically pouring concrete casings cor correctly. It's fixing leaky pipes. That's a hell of a lot easier technologically to deal with than intermittency, than um, uh, low, uh, uh, low energy densities, all of the problems that really plague uh, our current um, uh, renewables technologies, for instance. Um, the third reason um, is that uh, gas is um, uh, actually a, a really important platform for renewables. Um, right now, our ability to scale renewables is pretty much entirely dependent upon having gas, and uh, it's a lot easier to do if you have cheap gas um, to back it up. And without that backup, the limits to um, what you can do with wind and solar particularly are, 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 are quite substantial. And if you don't have gas and you're trying to you know, ramp coal plants, for instance, up and down, it's not even clear that there's any uh, actually uh, uh, carbon reduction benefit um, from intermittent renewables. The fourth reason that I'll point out is yes, there is a sunk, you know, we, you build new infrastructure, there's sunk cost in it. But of all the infrastructure we could build, gas is probably the least capital intensive. Um, it is a, uh, um, a, and most dependent on the fuel costs. Um, so as you move to gas, you build gas infrastructure, you build an infrastructure where you have relatively less sunk cost than almost any other en energy technology. And as you have a demand response, you see prices go back up. Uh, I think it's going to be a lot easier for us to get out of gas than it is for instance to get out of, it has been to get out of coal, um, and uh, I think for that matter than it will be to get out of enormous sunk costs in uh, renewables that, um, you know, really are going to be very limited in their ability to scale given the current technology we have. So for all of those reasons, I think we should be, as I said, doubling down on the gas revolution. Um, uh, and uh, I think we need to kind of get out of that old view that because it's fossil, it's bad. I mean, um, I'll take some progress over basically no progress any day, which is what we've sort of really had prior to the gas revolution. A quick note on coal. I saw just as I was heading over here a report out from the Energy Information Administration that indicated that in 2012, um, China burned as much coal as the rest of the world combined. Interesting note. Uh, well, I just got a question from the audience which actually sparked something that I've been thinking about too, and that is the potential of uh, using the plentiful natural gas we have now as a, as a transportation fuel, either in compressed natural gas form or in gas to liquids, which um, a number of the larger oil companies are starting to explore. It's very expensive now, but as long as there's a big gap, a delta between gas prices and oil prices, uh, it can make some sense. Does either of you have any view on that, gas to liquids or natural gas as a transportation fuel? Well, I can see a motivation to do that for national security reasons, and um, I can see a potential win there for the environment or an incremental gain. But at the moment, um, uh, we need to look at the science. Uh, the science says that when you switch from diesel fuel to compressed natural gas, mm -hmm. the break-even point as to how much methane could be emitted between the well and the truck, um, how much methane you take out of the ground that leaks fugitive emissions is 1%. Now, why is it 1% instead of 3.5% with coal? Well, it's 1% because diesel engines are very efficient and because diesel fuel has a lot less carbon per BTU than coal. Right now, the EPA estimate, um, and it's probably a wrong number that could be low, could be high, but the EPA estimate is 2.5% leaks. 
So right now, every truck we switch makes the climate problem worse. Worse than burning diesel. Worse than burning diesel. Mm -hmm. That's for CNG. LNG is even a lower break-even point because of the energy that you have to put in to make LNG. Same with um, gas to liquids. I, I, I actually agree with Fred. I, I, I am not particularly optimistic on gas as a climate strategy for uh, transportation. transportation and um, I think as opposed to in uh, you know electricity and other sectors where we use gas I think you actually if you're going to really make a big move to gas there are huge sunk costs uh, that make it very difficult to move uh, beyond it you have to go build an entire new sort of infrastructure to support it so uh, at least from a sort of climate perspective I think it's probably a bad idea. Ted in, in your remarks you mentioned that um, that innovation uh, in the energy world uh, takes time and money. Uh, the scientists tell us we don't have a lot of time. Congress, I think, will tell you we don't have a lot of money. Um, we spent $90 billion in the Recovery Act and the stimulus. Uh, we got a lot of benefits, um, but that progr those programs got a lot of criticism, too. I don't think this Congress uh, is going to ante up anything like the kinds of money you think is necessary. So where does this funding come from? Well, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll make a couple of observations, both on the, on the time and the money. Um, uh, I mean, at this point, uh, you know, I think anyone who tells you they think we're going to stay at 450 or 2 degrees, um, you know, needs to have their head examined. I think there's very little evidence that it's going to happen. I think we should remember that there's a lot of climate science saying we should try to avoid climate change. That number is, was basically arrived at at a political process. It's a fairly arbitrary um, uh, uh, number. Um, I'm all for trying to meet it. Um, but at the end of the day, you got to go as fast as you can, um, reduce emissions as much as you can, as quickly as you can, um, period. Um, and I think all of the talk about X target or Y target, and is it 350 or 450 or 550, has just been a, an, an immense distraction. Um, uh, um, wishing sort of arguments about, about um, what we're going to do four decades from now. And the real question is, what are we going to do now? Um, uh, so that, that's sort of one, and, and, and frankly, we may not, do we have time to kind of bet on a bunch of technologies? Well, the reality is we're all betting on those technologies. Um, uh, I think we, in our view, are perhaps a bit more explicit uh, about that. Um, but uh, uh, what's implicit in the longstanding environmental climate agenda was that if we set a cap or a price, the technologies will materialize. Um, and we kind of go, we got to go get the technologies, and if we go get the technologies uh, that we need, we can actually do the heavy lift, politi the, the, the political lift, the regulatory lift, the pricing lift, whatever it is, gets much, much easier to do. That leads to a question that just came up here from, it appears to be Andy Cameron from Augur Nexus. Uh, Wall Street will not invest in carbon numbers unless carbon is accurately counted. Is there a plan of instrumentation to count carbon emissions? I'm not quite sure <laughs> I'm not what either. that means. Maybe Fred knows. Uh, Scripps is putting online um, uh, regional um, sensors that uh, both measure carbon and methane um, emission, but it's pretty easy to, to measure carbon emissions. I mean, when you know how much uh, coal you burn, you know how much carbon you put out. Mm -hmm. Same with gasoline and diesel sales. Uh, methane is the hardest when it's, because you're not burning it, it's the unburned methane, the unburned natural gas that's a problem. So that we need to do a better job getting sensors on. But I, do, I just want to say, John, that um, I hear a lot of pessimism from Ted. I'm sure you think, Ted, it's realism. But I'm not ready to give up on 450 or 2 degrees. And I know it's going to be really hard. But what makes me hopeful, and there's a difference between hope and optimism. Optimism is a prediction that it's all going to be fine. I don't know that I'm optimistic, but I'm hopeful. Hopeful is a verb with its sleeves rolled up. I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful because why are we in this fix? We're in this fix. Because the people invest in things that are profitable. 
And things are profitable when you don't price carbon, when you don't pro price that externality. Once we get capitalism, the greatest system that's ever been put together to organize human activities, unfortunately with a seamy underside, one of the seamy undersides being it chews up nature in the atmosphere, once we get capitalism and entrepreneurs harnessed to invent, have a profit motive to bring to market the technologies that are clean, uh, there's reason to be very hopeful. Ted says, well, it's not going to happen. We're not going to price carbon. We're not going to cap carbon. I've exceeded that in the United States in this Congress. But the four, the four biggest countries in the world are in Indonesia, the United States, China, and Brazil. Indonesia and the United States don't have a cap on carbon, although the United States does in California, which is, after all, the biggest state. Um, Brazil has a cap on carbon. They still need to figure out the rules. They've made more progress than any other nation on Earth reducing carbon emissions. They've vastly decreased uh, their deforestation rate. And China, well, China's over a billion people, but now, today, 250 million people live in cities and provinces where they are doing, in the 12th five-year plan, cap-and-trade programs. So two of the four big emitters are moving, plus the European Union, plus Australia, plus New Zealand, and you know a handful of other countries, including South Korea, which is a big engine. So the idea that no one's going to do this anywhere in the Euro world, we can't make 450, let's, you know, you know, we're going to sail through 450, we just have to accept that. I, I just don't accept that. Well, I, I just have to say, I, it's not actually pessimism. It's, it's, uh, I, my point is actually that, the, that these numbers are actually uh, sort of a distraction. Um, that the old, I mean, you have to realize that this cap and trade idea is just literally picking up the old, what we call pollution paradigm, which goes back to the early, much earlier air and water pollution laws. It goes, we're going to go set a scientific standard um, Based on that, we're going to regulate emissions, um, and, uh, and that's how we'll solve the problem. And that but worked pretty well worked. for local <laughs> and regional and national water and air pollution law laws. It is not going to work well uh, for energy. And the point, actually, about the political constraints on this is not that you can't get Australia or Europe or China to do something that they call a cap and trade program. It's that the program is not going, the way these programs, by the time they go through the political process, get set up, um, uh, the meat grinder of politics and interests and the fact that no politician actually wants to bring the pain to their constituents. Um, you get programs that can't actually have much impact on emissions. I mean, this is the, 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 the conceit of carbon pricing theory was that you could go set up this sort of platonic ideal of a carbon price, whether it was through a cap uh, and trade program or a carbon tax, um, that would uniformly and in, an and in a consistent economy-wide way internalize uh, environmental externality. And what we see again and again and again is that it doesn't happen that way. Um, and what we get out the other end are things like the, the ETS, which again, there's no evidence whatsoever that the ETS has had any impact on the basic trajectory of European emissions, and there's not much reason to think that any of these other programs are either. So that is, at, is the critique. I want to say, we'll go to one other thing, which is uh, Fred's sort of a magnificent pain to the market and capitalism um, uh, and, and, and prices. Um, well, the actual evidence on what's called induced innovation, which is what the fancy word for what Fred was talking about, we set a price signal and private firms, entrepreneurs, the market will go and do the innovation. There's almost no evidence for that hypothesis in response to environmental pricing. In fact, there is a new London School of Economics paper that just came out that actually uses U.S panel data to demonstrate that market-based environmental policies have been inversely correlated with uh, private sector R&D spending. Um, and there's a bunch of reasons for that. But um, Let I me just interject one question and, and try and get a relatively quick answer. If um, a cap and a tax 
uh, are politically impossible. Regulation is politically difficult, and it will be for um, for Obama in the second term. The one sort of bipartisan uh, slash cowardly approach is often taken is the um, renewable electricity standard or the clean electricity standard, which sets an overall goal of clean electricity and lets the market take over from there. Does that meet your criteria as a signal to the market that might work? I think it actually, in terms of deploying clean energy technologies, I think it demonstrably works better than pricing. Fred, is that something uh, We're supportive you guys of renewable portfolio standards too, especially in the absence of pricing or cap. So we agree. Okay, so maybe, maybe that's something that can move in this Congress. And, and President Obama has spoken about it in his last two or three States of the Union addresses. Okay, we're gonna, I'm going to try and get through as many of these questions as possible, so I'll ask uh, some of them are specifically directed to panelists too. This one's for Ted. Where or who should be the federal innovation sponsor? Should it continue to be the Department of Defense? Will that be adequate for orphan technology? Well, I think, um, I mean, when you look at- What is orphan technology, by the way? I'm not sure I understand the term. I think Armand Cohen earlier today uh, described nuclear and CCS as orphan technologies. Um, I think that uh, technologies where there's just not um, sort of any place to go get them done. Uh, I, I, I think that, as I said, I think we need to take a hard look at our whole innovation system. And I think it actually goes beyond energy, but obviously energy is a really important place. And one of the reasons, um, I mean, really so much innovation has come out of DOD over the last uh, 50 years, and we're actually doing a fair amount of clean energy innovation there. And if I were making bets on where the kind of next big breakthroughs came through, I think I, as much as I sometimes feel like I have to defend DOE, I think I'd put my money on DOD because they're actually a consumer of the technologies that they're developing and investing in. Um, and I think that's a really, really important uh, characteristic. I think one of the big country's questions on energy but beyond energy, just more broadly on innovation, is if we're in, entering an era where we're actually going to be sort of continuing to scale back our investments, uh, you know, how much money, how much of our budget we put into DOD, which has been this incredible innovation engine for a half century, uh, how are we going to make up that? Uh, we, if we hadn't had DOD, we'd have had to go invent some institution to do something like it over the last 50 years if we were going to ex experience the kind of affluence that we've experienced. And I think sort of one of the big questions for policymakers long term is if we're not going to continue to do that through DOD, uh, how and where are we going to do it? Um, I'm going to summarize this uh, question which begins clean coal, oxymoron, threat or menace. Um, is this a realistic technology if, if there's one technology that the Department of Energy has spent nearly as much money uh, as on fracking, it's so-called clean coal. Is this a viable solution, Fred? Well, uh, the only clean coal would be coal where you sequester the carbon. And I would say um, that we are not going to have firms sequestering carbon until there's a requirement uh, to do that. So yes, uh, Ted and I agree we should be making coal cleaner in terms of conventional pollutants. He's a little more tepid on the CO2 emissions. I don't see what's different about CO2. I think um, in the history of the world, we've solved pollution going into the air when we've regulated it. And so I think EPA should be aggressively going after CO2 for existing as well as uh, new power plants. Um, acid rain, by the way, was all about power plants and the electric sector and the energy industry. The same argument Ted makes today that it could not work because electricity prices needed to be low was made then. We show that you could decouple the pollution from power plants from electricity prices. Electricity prices, you know, went down. Pollution went down too. So, um, and on the EU, I just might add Ellerman at all um, is, is one great study with evidence that the EU ETS is working despite Ted's protestations to the contrary. Well, I'll, without getting into sort of dueling uh, papers, um, 
I, I have looked at actually, I actually have looked at LMN and what it finds is through fairly extremely uh, torturous uh, calculations, uh, essentially trying to create a counterfactual of what emissions might have been without it, they conclude that it achieved quite modest reductions. Um, uh, you know, as I said, there's, you know, and that was in a period when you had relatively high, high carbon prices, um, which we don't anymore. Um, but, but let me um, get to the meat of it. I actually kind of, uh, I'm actually in some ways more optimistic about capturing carbon from gas um, than from coal um, because I think it's a technologically easier lift. Um, and if you've got lots of cheap gas, um, I think it's, it's uh, potentially certainly a starting place. I actually agree. I don't have any problem with CO2 regs um, uh, under the Clean Air Act. I think we'll do them. I think they'll be quite modest. Um, and I think if you have a lot of cheap gas, they can have a big impact. Um, but uh, this goes to the larger point, which is that when you have a cheap, clean substitute, anything is possible. The cap and trade stuff worked because in the decade prior to that, we actually developed cheap substitutes, mostly because of command and control regulations, as well as a number of other things. That cap and trade program, again, pretty overwhelming in the literature that it sparked very little actual innovation. Um, but um, I think that, you know, if you look at those CO2 regs, and the air pollution regs that have bo both come online, the fact that we had a lot of cheap gas just made the political lift uh, much easier um, and really puts the wind at the backs of, of, the, of the regulatory and political efforts uh, to shut down coal, um, as well as creating market dynamics that um, make that easier. Ted, let me give you one concrete example of innovation. Maybe you don't consider it innovation because it's not big, fancy, whiz-bang, new device, but after the acid rain law came into effect and it made it profitable to reduce sulfur by as much as possible and you could even trade those extra reductions to another factory that couldn't figure it out. Uh, in New York uh, where I live, the boilers that had existed for you know, decades uh, knowing that it was impossible to mix low sulfur coal into the boiler uh, at more than 10%, uh, they figured out, well, let's try 15, because if we can make it work, we can make more money, and 15 works. So they pushed it to 20. They pushed it to 25. Soon they got over 50%. Okay, that's not a gee whiz uh, piece of innovation, but it wouldn't have happened without the profit motive and the people on the factory floor knowing they had a reason they could make their boss and their company more profitable by tinkering. I now, you, you may don't know you that, may Fred. Well, I mean, you don't. Resources you don't. for the Future has, you know, written papers about yeah, this. Yeah, and actually they concluded that there was very little innovation from the R and from, from the uh, cap and trade. Not salt, the papers CO I've read. Yeah, but so too. <laughs> I've, read, I've, just cited, I just, I've just wrote a paper and cited it. The, um, now we have similar things with energy efficiency and demand side management that is possible. Tinkering can be done if there's an incentive to do it but we won't be deploying a lot of existing technologies um, you know, without regulations. Uh, absolutely, in the next couple of years in the United States, we should try all the approaches. We should invest in R&D. But to say that regulation on carbon can't and won't work, well, I, I think that's a big mistake. Um, this question recognizes, of course, that CO2 is a global problem and it's that addressing it in this country <laughs> has only a limited impact. If fossil fuels are the problem, wherever they're burned, should the U.S. export gas or coal to other countries? The low price of gas has driven down the price of U.S. coal and increased its use in Europe. What about exports? I, I guess my view is, well, a couple things. On the gas, I think the gas export issue is just a red herring. Um, I don't think we're going to build enough. I, I, even under the most optimistic scenarios, we're not going to export that much gas. It's not going to have a big impact on U.S. prices, nor is it going to have a big impact on anyone else's emissions. Um, mm -hmm. uh, because just once you get to the, um, the cost of exporting gas, it just raises the cost pretty substantially. So I think we'll export to Europe, we'll export to Japan. I don't think it's going to have much impact. The thing that might have an impact is if we start exporting the gas technologies. Um, so the China, India. The drilling other, technology? Pardon, the, the drilling, drilling technologies. Technology. Um, uh, you know, on coal, um, 
I, I mean, I think it's going to be actually interesting to see. I mean, obviously, coal exports are up, um, um, but we're also uh, shutting down coal mines. Um, so I don't think that uh, we're going to export all of that coal that we are. Um, and I think, I think there's a couple new studies that, that conclude that um, uh, uh, there is some leakage in emissions with, with coal being displaced here and exported elsewhere, but it is not nearly, uh, it does not nearly uh, equal the decline that we've seen from the switch from coal to gas domestically. We are exporting a lot of coal to Germany and their emissions are going up. This fact of the matter is. I agree, though, that I don't think natural gas exports will end up being huge. It's a long-term, multi-billion dollar bet of what the prices of natural gas will be. I don't, I think it's unlikely a lot of people will be willing to make those multi-billion dollar bets. Uh, here's a question for both of you. With our current ethanol industry needing other feedstocks than corn and soy because of food versus fuel problems, is it really an established industry that can afford to lose financial and policy support? Does ethanol continue to need um, federal price support and subsidies? Um, it's a mystery why uh, we have an ethanol mandate in this country. Um, it's certainly from a climate perspective. A mystery, perhaps not. You, you have political people on your staff, don't you? <laughs> uh, from the standpoint of scientific, an economic mystery, perhaps. Yes. Scientific rationale, or what's good for our country to have so much of our corn being turned into fuel without uh, significant greenhouse gains or energy gains. Uh, is deplorable. Any opinion on I that? I don't really have anything to add to that. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right, I'm just going to read this. I'm not sure what the question is in here. Uh, in either of the futures you advocate, natural gas is a bridge, but minimize as much as possible, Fred, or double down, Ted. Do you know what the science says about the climate impacts this century? The IEA says, in the best case scenario, golden rules for the golden age of gas, with gas is about four degrees, I, I presume for this century. Uh, with one to three percent leakage, it could be as much as six degrees. Is this acceptable? I, I think anyone who tells you, uh, I, you know, the dirty secret of these models is that they're just completely based on, uh, decide the outcome you want and then put in your assumptions about how clean or dirty a coal plant a new coal plant in 2060 or 2070 is going to be, mm -hmm. what the leakage rate uh, is, um, what the climate sensitivity actually is. It just goes on and on. I just find these kinds of debates um, sort of a distraction. Um, I, 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 it just um, uh, anyone who thinks they can tell you, you know, um, what the future looks like and therefore uh, what the temperature is going to be in 2100. I just don't believe it. I see we have uh, around eight minutes, giving each of you about four minutes to sort of respond to things you've heard earlier or sort of make some kind of closing remarks. Um, I think Fred went first, so Ted, why don't you summarize what, what message you want this audience to take away? Well, I think um, uh, Fred, um, I think Fred has sort of framed this at times in ways that I think is actually um, uh, a little misleading. Is it, is the question isn't, do you need any regulation? Should you try to regulate carbon or not? It's a question of sort of what's the dog and what's the tail? Um, and our argument you know, continues to be uh, that technology is the dog and that you're not going to wag that with regulation. That as you get better technologies, I think you create the possibility of having effective regulations. And I think as we see with gas, you can do it through conventional air pollution laws. You can do it through CO2 regs under the Clean Air Act. You can ultimately do it with a cap um, or a carbon price. But every one of those is dependent on the existence of cheap substitutes. Our difference is actually where those substitutes come from. And Fred makes an argument um, that that price incentives, private firms, and the market will sort of do the heavy lifting here. Um, I don't think it's well supported uh, um, uh, in, in either the literature or our experience. Um, 
uh, either in theory or practice. Um, and our argument is, you know, do some regulations here and there as you think, but the main event here is actually go investing in the technologies, in developing the technologies that we need, um, that that is a public good, it is the central challenge, um, and if we are not um, uh, sort of centrally focused on that, we're not going to make much progress on the problem. Fred, last word? Well, just uh, two points. Um, one, on intermittency. Uh, for 100 years, we have known that in order to have the electric grid work, you have to have the right voltage. So as demand has gone up and down, uh, we have modulated supply up and down. Today we know, uh, through our experience with the internet and other modern uh, pieces of infrastructure, unlike the grid, today we know that we can not only modulate um, supply to make it hit demand, but we can modulate demand too. We can give consumers uh, the option um, of allowing uh, their electric car batteries to be charged overnight, or their refrigerators, instead of being def uh, defrosting at 3 p.m. in the afternoon to receive a signal from the power company to def defrost at 3 a.m. Uh, and so uh, there are now companies making tens of millions of dollars selling demand-side management into the system. In other words, agreeing to reduce their demand during peak hours, during large parts of the year, not just summer peaks, and that means a smarter grid uh, really does um, help a lot with the intermittency issue, which is a real issue, but also a, a solvable one. And my second and last point is that, um, you know, there's a lot we do agree on. And uh, I don't think the two approaches are mutually exclusive. Absolutely, we need to do a lot with R&D. We need to support the development of new technologies through non-regulatory measures. And we need to regulate, too. In my world, we want to have that backstop, that legal limit. I agree, the more clean technologies make it easier to reg regulate, no doubt about it. Um, more evidence that these two ideas, uh, two approaches, both have to proceed apace as fast as we can, because there is no time to lose. Humanity has its back up against the wall um, and as I said uh, before, I think there's a lot of reasons to be hopeful. Hope is a verb with its sleeves rolled up, and I'm <laughs> counting on all of you to have your sleeves rolled up. Quick question, just since we do have another minute or two. Um, President Obama, in his uh, second inaugural address, uh, spoke more assertively about climate than he had since 2009. Um, does either of you have much hope or optimism about s substantial progress, either domestically or internationally, over the next four years in the political climate we're in today? I think U.S. emissions are going to keep going down, so I'm optimistic about that. Um, as a result of policy or as a result yeah, of... Yeah, well, I mean, if you can, first of all, you know, the shale gov gas revolution is a result of policy. Right. Um, and don't let anyone tell you different. Um, secondly, um, you know, uh, with the existing air pollution regs, I think they're going to do more. Um, I, I, I think that's going to work. I will say one other thing, which is that the reason that he spoke so freely about climate is that he took the toxic policies off the table right after his election when he went out and basically said, I ain't going to go die on that carbon pricing hill again. Um, that's why he felt emboldened to then go talk about how he was going to do something about climate change, and I think there's a lesson there. Fred? The, uh, you know, we've had in the last year, just in 2012, 12, uh, 11 storms in the United States that have cost over a billion dollars. Uh, we had Derek Jeter shortstop for the New York Yankees in Davos last week um, saying something is going on. We had Christine Lagarde from the IMF saying, if we don't get serious about climate, we're going to be toasted, roasted, uh, fried, and grilled. Um, I think at the center of the economic system now, the president of the World Bank, Dr. Jim Kim, spent seven of his 10 minutes uh, from the podium at Davos talking about climate change. The center of our economic system, people realize we've got to do something. I'm not optimistic that we're going to have some Copenhagen-like multilateral agreement 
But I do think there's a chance for some bilateral agreements with John Kerry as Secretary of State, passionate about climate, with the President, passionate about climate. And I do think there is a chance for the President in this country to lead a conversation, which he's promised to do, to connect the dots for people so that people understand this is not about Republicans or Democrats, conservatives or liberals, but about our children. And I thought his line in the inaugur inauguration that if we don't get this right, we are betraying our children uh, was exactly what um, was the right thing to say. You know, talk is in action, but silence for the last two years has been very expensive. Thank you. You can all, you can all stay just a minute here. So, so as um, moderator and sponsor, I get a, I mean, maybe as, as Lawrence O'Donnell say, the last word. And um, before I do that, I do want to thank, this was an incredibly um, long and arduous task to put this conference together and make it so seamless. And part of that credit goes to Matt and his team, but also to Catherine Engstad and Andrea Matus and Alexis Ferrin. So please uh, join me in thanking them. So let me just make five or six really quick points from what I heard today and kind of try to summarize what I've heard today. Uh, one I heard today was that uh, we, we, can, we should do it all, that, that there's, um, everything is needed. And yet, when we heard from Armand Cohen about the fact that we're investing massively more globally in deployment than we are in R&D, uh, it suggests that we maybe can't do it all. Uh, you know, in a platonic world where all of us were kings and we had control over the budgets and the regulatory system, we probably could do it all. But that's not the reality we live in. The reality we live in is a world of constraints and uh, where there have to be tough political choices. So I, I think we just can't assume that we're going to do it all or can do it all. We have to make choices. And that's, again, why we tried that, uh, the innovation, Energy Innovation U.S. budget, which is an attempt to say, look, we have to make real choices. If you were Senate uh, Appropriations Chair, what are the choices you, would you make? The second uh, thing I heard a little bit was this notion somehow that the costs are going to continue to fall, that we can sort of rely on that. And Ted talked about that, that virtually every single model out there that says, don't worry, we can solve climate change, they built in this assumption that the costs will continue to fall. This is a little bit like the old joke of the economist, the, three, the economist, the engineer, and the physicist on the boat. It sinks and they get in the lifeboat and there's a can, there's a whole set of canned rations. They have no life, they have no can opener and the physicist says, well, we'll figure out a way to use uh, chemical, excuse me, we use some sort of lever and the physicist, chemist says, we'll use some sort of chemical reaction. The economist says, don't worry about any of that. We'll just assume we have a can opener. <laughs> Uh, and there's a little bit about that, sort of this ma almost magical thinking. We'll just assume that it continues, and yet if you listen to many of the innovations we were talking about, they just didn't happen. They, they were conscious decisions were made to allocate resources towards them, including the MIT battery example we heard. So if we don't keep continuing allocating resources and fighting for them, particularly in a budget where we're, believe it or not, thinking about cutting the federal R&D budget 10% next year with sequestration, we won't get that automatic innovation. The third point is uh, a little bit, well, excuse me, related to that, it's a little bit like, how do we get there? And it's this notion somehow, this Fred's point that we get there through price, and I, I maybe shouldn't bring this up, Fred, because we don't have a chance to debate it, but I do think that any, any of your economists who would assert that price is the answer, it's incumbent upon them to solve a major intellectual puzzle, which is why are there no electric cars in Europe? Because if price is the magic elixir, then with a $450 a ton price, carbon price on gasoline in Europe, that's the de facto carbon price because that's how big their gas taxes are. So they have a $450 a ton price and there are no electric cars in Europe, or virtually none. This has not spurred people to invent really great batteries because really great batteries are incredibly hard to figure out. So prices can play a role, I would argue, but they're not enough. If $450 a ton doesn't get you really great batteries, would 1,000, 2,000? The answer is no, you have to get innovation. The third point is this notion of cost versus technical capabilities. I, I think we could, if, if we really assume that if we didn't solve carbon, price, carbon and global greenhouse gas emissions within a year, that we would all be dead. 
I guarantee you we would solve that problem. The choice is life versus sort of, you know, not a very good life and have to pay a lot of money and spend 30 or 40 percent on energy, but we'd be alive. That's not really the point. The point is, what are the choices that we have in front of us and are most people willing to make those choices? And right now most people are not willing to make those choices because the choices are, are not about life versus uh, survival and, and, and expensive energy. They're between eh, maybe something's happening in the future and me paying more right now. The fourth point I think is I, I raised it earlier this morning and that's this notion of American warming. And I guess I would encourage us and hopefully maybe John when you're writing about this stuff is any time you hear a proposal from anybody, a politician or an advocate, ask the question will this solve more than American warming? Will the California What's that mean? Will the California cap and trade solve global warming? Will putting, uh, will getting uh, uh, coal-fired power plants a little cleaner solve global warming? How does everything we do in the U.S. solve global warming? How does it get to globally deployed zero emissions technologies? If it doesn't get us there, if it doesn't start to move us down that path as opposed to move us down the U.S. path only, I would suggest that there's a problem. Fifth. What, was, what I was struck by, particularly in the nuclear panel, was how risk averse America has become. When we hear about a lot of the innovations around the world, whether it's the solar panel uh, cheap deployment in Germany, or whether it's uh, nuclear in, in, in Korea, uh, we have to look at that and say these people are taking big risks. They're putting innovation first. And America seems to have missed that, uh, that, that memo. Uh, lastly, there's this notion that we don't have time to lose. And sure, that's true, we don't have time to lose, but it's a little bit akin to the analogy of someone who's dying of cancer. And they're going to die uh, if you don't come up with a cure. But coming up with a cure is going to take five years and they have six years to live. Or we could simply say we're going to apply the current met met medicines that we have for the cancer patient and it means that they'll live a little bit longer but they're still going to die. Yes, we don't have time, but that's not the right question. The right question is, how do we get to a zero carbon world by 2025, 2035, 2045, whatever it is? All the rest of the solutions are essentially akin to giving the person a drug that doesn't cure cancer, but essentially just prolongs their life a little bit. So I think with those, uh, all of that there, I think the most important thing we can do uh, is we need to be thinking about how do we get solutions that are gonna scale, that are going to be global, that are going to be universally adopted, and perhaps most importantly, are things that we can get done in this political environment. Uh, we're not in a political environment where it's going to be easy to get anything done, but it seems to me that as pragmatists, to Fred's political people on his uh, third leg of his team, we've got to think about the things that we can get bipartisan agreement on, and to us, innovation is one of those things that both parties uh, are much more willing to agree on than some of these other uh, issues that we have been talking about. So with that, um, again, I want to thank all of you um, for coming and staying the entire day. Uh, this was, I think, a really great conference, and I want to thank all the great speakers and the moderator, again, for spending their, their valuable time with us. And uh, the videos of this, hopefully the cues, uh, the questions that we didn't get a chance to ask, uh, and the PowerPoints will all be on our website and a link on Breakthrough's website as well. So uh, again, thank you, everybody, and uh, good luck for the rest of the day. <laughs>